Adrian N. Breitfelder, you are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held on Tuesday, June 20th, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting a work session on speed study data. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for June 20th, 2023. As a reminder to viewers and listeners, due to the nature of tonight's meeting topic, public input is not accepted. However, you may contact the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Kavanaugh? Here. Council Members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you. Our work session topic is speed study data related to automated speed enforcement recommendations. I will turn it over to Police Chief Jeremy Jensen. Let, let the record show that Mr. Resnick is here. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Resnick. We're glad to have you. Good evening. Uh, Jeremy Jensen, Chief of Police. So I'm not going to do much talking tonight for, for once on this topic, but I'm going to let the, the da data people talk. So back in March when I presented on this, you all asked for more information, particularly about research and about data. So the engineering department has spent the spring doing some speed studies, and they will present that here. And then a Bishek from the city manager's office will be presenting on some of the research he's done on automated uh, enforcement systems. So with that, I'm going to step back and let the uh, Bishek come up and start the presentation. Thank you, Jeremy. This is Abhishek Rai, uh, ICMA management fellow from the city manager's office. So we started looking at some of the national studies first. Uh, not first, but I, my focus was more on the national studies. And uh, I looked at the uh, study published by the National Transportation Safety Board. Um, this is called, with the name uh, Safety Study Reducing Speeding Related Crashes Involving Passenger Vehicles. And this was one of the major studies uh, published with the focus on speeding and how it affects fatalities. And we had some great uh, data points and which the researchers highlighted in this research. And this was published in 2017, but uh, it, they started studying it in 2015. So they studied it for two years and published it after a study of period of two years, and in which they conducted a review of existing literature and interviewed several stakeholders, including employees from various government bodies and law enforcement agencies. And they interviewed a lot of people and uh, uh, they also looked at several studies. They also analyzed data from two national databases published by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. This included the FARS data, which is the census of all crashes in the United States um, on uh, uh, not only crashes, but this is a census of uh, related to transportation uh, safety. And uh, the research analyzed safety uh, speeding related fatalities from uh, 2005 to 2014. So when they started, 2014 was the latest data point. And uh, year over year, if you, uh, if you see uh, the table on the uh, left-hand side, uh, it, it's 30% uh, of, on average, 30% of all uh, accidents or fit, speeding fit, uh, speeding related fatalities in the United States uh, were uh, due to, they were speeding related fatalities out of all fatalities in, in the US. And uh, I also included uh, the 2021 number. With, now this was published by the IIHS, which is the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety. Um, and uh, in 2021, uh, a total of 12,330 deaths, which is also 29% of all motor vehicle accidents occurred were speeding related crashes. So just to show consistency, and uh, IIHS also used the same database uh, published by FARS, um, not FARS, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, so moving on, but uh, they also, uh, analyzed and looked at several characteristics of uh, what happened, related, like why these accidents happened and some of the characteristics which I'll be uh, going into more detail. And uh, the NTB, NTSB researchers found uh, focused on fatal crashes in 2014. Uh, so they looked, 
specifically on the 2014 data, the latest data they had, uh, to and they uh, they looked at these characteristics in detail. So, in for example, in 2014, 8,393 speeding vehicles were involved in fatal crashes. So, this is more on the details of how many crashes happened, and of these speeding vehicles, 77% uh, were passenger vehicles. And this study is focused on the passenger, speeding passenger vehicle and fatality rate rates. Um, they were involved in uh, 6,369 fatal crashes, and these resulted in 77,223 uh, sp speeding passenger vehicle related fatalities. Now this is something which will keep coming back to because these numbers will change, not change, but it's uh, sometimes it's six, uh, some of the tables in the next few slides might add up to 6,422, while some might six, be 6,369, because sometimes they are looking at the number of crashes, while sometimes they are looking at uh, fatalities. So that's why I just laid it out before before going into that. Um, so what some of, one of the uh, first characteristics I'll uh, which they touched upon was injur injury sev severity. So this chart on screen is the percentage of vehicle occupants with serious or fatal injury in single uh, vehicle crash. So um, looking at the rate at which uh, fatalities or si serious injuries takes place at different speeds uh, at the bottom over here. So even at the sp same speed, they found out that the chance of uh, the percentage of fatalities or serious injuries go uh, is almost double when the passenger is speeding over the speed limit versus if it's in the speed limit if it's traveling at the same speed but it's it's on a road which is built for that kind of speeds uh, so for example uh, going 61 and over if the if it's not speeding it's 4.3% which is the percentage for fatality or serious injuries, while 9.8% when it's speeding uh, over the speed limit. And it's consistently here, it's 2.3 to 4.4 and 1.6 to 2.5. So this is constantly at a double rate. Uh, at the, they found out that it's, uh, when it's above the speed limits, the injury rate almost doubles. They also explored the road type and land use um, they explore the relationship of fatal accidents, um, and these numbers, these percentages in this table might not add up to 100, and they might look a bit odd, but it's actually the total number of uh, fatal accidents, uh, fatal speeding related accidents on these type of roads out of the all fatal accidents, which, which is a different table. And they found out that 24.4% uh, of all accident, all uh, fatal, uh, fatal crashes involved speeding passenger vehicles. And this was higher, uh, if you look on all the category, this was the highest category was local roads as on the road side, which is higher than interstates, uh, other principal arterial, minor arterial collector roads at 30%. And, uh, the, the biggest number on this table is 35%, and so local roads had the largest percentage, and local rural roads had uh, the highest rate, where 35% of fatal crashes on rural local roads involved speeding passenger vehicles. Moving on to the, uh, the speeds at which these accidents took place and the urban-rural uh, split, um, so most rural accidents in that year took place uh, at speeds of 55 to 60 uh, mile per hour while on the on on the rural side while uh, it the highest category on the urban side was 35 to 40 so this was a very detailed study and uh, just wanted to highlight some of the data the researchers found out in this study they also explored some of the other characteristics uh, like alcohol uh, impairment and age which relates to fatal crashes uh, in, in passenger vehicles, uh, related to passenger vehicles. And they, the NT, NTSB uh, examined alcohol impairment for, uh, for almost six, over 6,400 speeding passenger vehicles. And they just found out that 
only 43% were alcohol impaired, while 57% were non-alcohol impaired. And they also concluded that uh, just solving alcohol, addressing alcohol impairment would not uh, uh, alleviate the risks of speeding, especially when it comes to fatality in passenger vehicle. And uh, they also explored age, uh, and the three groups with most speeding uh, passenger vehicle were uh, ages under 20, 20 to 24 year olds, and 20 to 20, 25 to 29 year olds, the younger uh, age groups. Um, and these three groups include uh, 3,167 drivers for the 2014, uh, representing 50% of uh, all speeding passenger vehicle drivers in fatal crashes. So this is uh, just they wanted to explore the relationship with age, and they found out younger age groups were more affected by speeding-related fatalities and injuries. We also looked, uh, I also looked at the uh, US Department of Trans Transportation, and uh, uh, they have this uh, safe systems approach where uh, US DOT adapts a safe system approach as a guiding paradigm to addressing roadway safety. And uh, the, the safe system approach has been embraced by transportation community as an effective way to address and mitigate the risks. And the wheel represents the objectives they have, uh, which includes uh, all sorts of uh, risks related to uh, road safety. And uh, safer speeds is a separate category in itself. Uh, besides other categories, which they ob their objective is to make it safe. So this was also one of the interesting uh, other resource we uh, looked at. Um, this is how uh, the effects of speed uh, roadway are described on their website. And this is more related to pedestrian safety. For example, uh, they have provided this diagram. This is their just a screenshot from their website, and uh, we can look at the description. But they have pro provided this diagram of speeding and its risks to pedestrians. Risk, and this is risk of death. So, for example, uh, at at the if there's a accident at 58 miles per hour, there's a uh, not miles miles per yeah miles per hour. There's a 90% uh, risk of uh, uh, of death or fatality and 75% at uh, 50 miles per hour. And this is interesting, and it goes down as the risk, uh, as the speeds goes down. So besides these national studies, we also looked at some of the data specific to the city of Dubuque. And I'll uh, invite Justine, uh, which is our traffic in who is the traffic engineer, to discuss some of this data. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, hi, I am Justine. I am one of the engineers with uh, the city that is going to help present with the data this evening. So, <clears throat> um, this traffic data is um, kind of what Jeremy Jensen said in the beginning. It, it, it took us a couple months to get all this data collected. Um, in this picture, I show a wonderful counter that I use daily. Um, this goes on top of the roadway. So this is also in conjunction with cameras that we can use. I use this mainly for areas that I can't see or if I kind of just want a quick and easy, you know, something to throw out on the road for a good 48 hours. So. Um, that is normally requested or can be requested through a citizen um, saying, you know, hey, I, I have a speeder through here or, you know, I would just like to request, maybe I want my speed limit changed to, you know, 20 miles an hour, which sometimes can't happen, but, um, or something that they just want us to look at and, and verify that this is a speeding <coughs> issue through town. If that is the case, then I do kind of help them through the process of, okay, I can talk to the police department and get a speed shield up and, um, figure out if we can really do some some changes here with the speed limit or um, some sort of other traffic calming situation. But we use those for you know speed studies or um, developments as well. So we will take the data 
um, that is collected and give those to developers and say, you know, this is what we have, this is what we collected, this is the dates that we have, and um, everything like that, and just give them that information or help them collect that information as well. Um, like I said, with the cameras, we can um, export that data and give them the opportunity to look at that themselves. Um, and that also helps with warrants as well. So if we have a right turn lane that needs to be implemented or um, maybe, it, maybe it, a, a street does have a very high traffic volume, that, um, that needs to be recorded and that can be done by placing this counter out for 48 hours. We can do up to a week. It does get a little bit um, refined data if we do up to a week. We're really just looking for this annual average daily traffic number. So that tells us, you know, hey, there's, there's 4,000 vehicles going this direction and 4,000 vehicles going the other direction. So that's a total of 8,000 vehicles on that street. So um, that data can be widely used. Um, we have 19 various locations here throughout the city um, that we kind of randomly chose. Um, Troy Cross and Engineering Tech and I are the main implementers of these traffic counters. Um, so the data that we collected is from, from this study and um, recent studies that we've had in the past, I would say five years as well, just sprinkling that in there for different locations. So I will have Gus Ahoyas um, explain that data for us. Thank you. Thanks, Justine. Uh, Gus Sahoyas, city engineer. I want to thank Justine Hall and Troy Kress for collecting all this data. Again, um, Justine mentioned we, we're going to present on 19 locations, um, talk about the posted speeds. And so those 19 locations, there's really 38 data sets that we have there, eastbound, westbound, northbound, southbound. So I'll present a little bit on that. I'll probably go through the first three or four or five or six slowly and we can look at the data and comprehend it. And then as we go on through the data, it, you can see that I'll just probably just talk about how, what the percentage over on those particular areas. So uh, we'll talk about average daily counts on all these roadway sections that uh, we collected data. And then we'll put them in bins. So let's think real carefully. So if the speed limit's 25, we're going to talk about everybody going 36 to 40 and then 41 to 45 and so on. So we're talking anybody that's going 11 miles an hour or over tonight. We're not talking anybody that's going like 25 to 35. We're talking about everybody over. So remember when we present these numbers, it's at least 11 miles over the speed limit. So here we go. Okay, so the first data set is on the Northwest Arterial between JFK Road and Central Avenue. So the upper left, we're gonna talk about both directions. The light blue will be southbound, it'll be southbound, and the, the, the traffic southbound in that particular place is 3,430 vehicles. Now this one's probably the most startling, and we just presented you know, through, through the town, so it's coincidental, but 1,746 people or vehicles are going at least 11 miles over the speed limit. So that equates to 50.9% uh, are going at least 11 miles over the speed limit. And so Justine, she used the computer to put them in different bins, we call them, and the bins will be 11 to 15, um, 16 to 20, 21 to 25, and 26 to 30, and then over 31. So in that case, we're talking about people going at least 81 miles over the speed limit. So it's pretty significant, I mean, not 30, 31 miles over the speed limit, which is 81 miles. So um, northbound, we'll go through the first thing. The purple, the purple line, 940 people are going 11 to 15. Everybody see that? Okay. so. <laughs> then 16 to 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, 225, and then so forth, 56, 20, and then seven people, the computer registered, are going at least 31 miles over the speed limit. So that's the 37.0. So that's one data set out of the 19. Okay, the next 
place that we'll talk about is Peru Road. And uh, northbound, 355 are going 11 to 15 miles over the speed limit, 82, 16 to 20. And then at the very end, you can see 16 people are going 31 miles over the speed limit. And the speed limit there is 30, so they're going 61 miles an hour. So 16 people are going at least 61 miles an hour in that location um, going northbound. And then again, we'll take a look at the, the blue line. It's southbound. The traffic in that area was 3,426 vehicles that particular day. 455 are going over 10 miles an hour. That's the, the 369, the 68, the 14, the 6, and the 7 for 13.3 percent are going over the 10 mile an hour threshold or 11 mile an hour threshold. Okay, 32nd Street at Tiffany Court. We did this one for switch homes just to look at the uh, speed limit in that area. And eastbound, we have 40.7% are going at least 11 miles over the speed limit. So you can see that in just one day, between 11 and 15 miles over speed limit, 398 vehicles are going over the speed limit in that particular bin, the 11 to 15, for a total of 668 vehicles out of the 1639 are going over the 10 miles an hour. So these are significant data points, uh, 40, and then you can see the other direction westbound, we got 30.4%. Again, I keep on saying that again, are going at least 11 miles over the speed limit. So sig significant data that we've accumulated the last couple months. Okay, Northwest Arterial between, between Plaza Drive and JFK. Southbound, uh, 3,873 people are we detected. 733 are going over the speed limit or the threshold. And then northbound, we got 3,706 vehicles and 662. So you can see it's pretty consistent, 17.9 and 18.9 in each direction are going over that threshold. Central Avenue, now this wasn't as bad. Central Avenue between 24th and 25th Street. Uh, northbound, we had um, 6,000 vehicles, 6,007, 264 going over the speed limit, over that threshold. So that's only 4.4%. Uh, but still a lot, 264 people are going over the speed limit. It's 25 miles an hour, so that's significant. And then southbound in that area, we had 6,600 and 93 vehicles, 795, at least 11 miles over the speed limit, and that is 11.7%. So Romberg Avenue between Humboldt and Schiller Street. Um, northbound, we had 4.8%. Uh, southbound, we had 1.3%. So um, only 34 people are going over the speed limit in the southbound direction um, that day. Grandview Avenue between Aspen Drive and North Grandview area. Um, northbound, we had um, 2,719 vehicles, 216 were going over the threshold. And uh, southbound, we had 2,515, we have 282 going over the threshold. So 9.6 and 11.2% are going over that threshold in that particular spot um, the day that we measured that uh, traffic. Asbury Road between Harvest View and Matthews, uh, Matthews John Drive. So we have eastbound, we had 8329, 354 going over the threshold in the other direction westbound, we had 8854 and 253. So 2.9 and 4.3%, not as bad as other locations. But the speed limit here is 35, so yeah, stop and think about that. They're going 46 miles an hour. And we did have quite a few going 30 miles an hour over the speed limit. So at some time during the day, we got people going 30 plus 35. So we got 65 miles an hour in those particular areas. So um, 
it's significant when you see when you start looking at the upper limits of the bins that we've uh, accumulated the data. Clark Drive between Clark Crest and Woodworth Street eastbound and westbound directions. The eastbound direction we have 42.2 percent and 37.8 percent. So a lot of people are speeding in Mike Van Milliken's area. It looks like. <laughs> So uh, that's pretty significant. Um, Loris Boulevard between Booth Street and Glen Oak Street. Uh, eastbound, westbound directions. We got eastbound 3.3% and uh, westbound 11.0%. So still in the eastbound direction, 116 in the 11 to 15 mile an hour area are going over the, the threshold and then 286 for the westbound. So again, 3.3 and 11% on Loris Boulevard. Pennsylvania Avenue between Lenox and Illinois Street. Uh, westbound, 4,500 uh, vehicles a day, 130 were going over the speed limit. And the other direction, eastbound, 4,538 and 614 were going over the speed limit. So we go from 2.9 to 13.5 percent. I remember probably 30, 40 years ago, there always used to be vehicle or police presence in that area, and nobody sped on um, on Pennsylvania at all. Do you remember that? <laughs> I do, because everybody went slow on Pennsylvania, but there was always a squad car on Pennsylvania Avenue. Okay, Northwest Arterial between Asbury Road and Pennsylvania. Uh, the speed limit here in this area is 50 miles an hour, and these are some pretty significant results. Uh, we've got 29.9% uh, and 27.7% are going over the threshold. So southbound, we have 4,000 again, 34, and 1,116 people are going over the threshold. In the northbound direction, we have 3,512 and 1,050 are going over that threshold. And if you start looking at the bins, you know, most of them are in that 11 to 15, but then we still do have a few that are going 30 miles an hour over the speed limit. So and significant results on Northwest Arterial. Chevenel Road at Innovation, um, 2,510 vehicles going eastbound. Uh, we have 584. Um, going over the threshold, which is 23.3 percent. And westbound, 1,669 vehicles and 198 vehicles. Are, so 10 percent are going over the speed limit here. Crescent Ridge um, at 3651 Crescent Ridge. So speed limit in this area is 25 miles an hour. And uh, you can see from the results, 40.1 percent are going over the threshold. Uh, going eastbound and westbound, we have 21.7. I think that's pretty significant. I know there's a lot of speeders in that area. We have a lot of complaints in that particular area. South Grandview, south of Plymouth Court. Uh, speed limit on Grandview here is 25 miles an hour. And uh, northbound, we have 9% going over the threshold and 13.3% um, going um, southbound. So 605 and four, so 1,000 vehicles in this particular area are going over the speed limit a particular day. Cedar Cross Road at uh, 1095 Cedar Cross Road. Uh, speed limit at this location is 35 miles an hour. 8.2% uh, uh, eastbound are going over the speed limit or threshold and 18.9% are uh, going over the speed limit in the westbound direction. So Kelly Lane between Edwards and uh, Kelly Heights. The counts in that particular speed limit there is 25 miles an hour. And northbound we have 2,945. We got 1,088 going over the speed threshold is just 36.9% and southbound um, we have 6,265 vehicles 
and we counted 1113 are going at least 11 miles an hour or more over the speed limit. Um, I know that's one that we've always had complaints with on Kelly Lane speeders in that area. North Cascade Road, um, speed limit in that area is 35 miles an hour eastbound and westbound. Um, eastbound is really high at 40.5% are going over the speed limit and 11.2 in the westbound are going over the speed limit. Rockdale Road at 2550, the speed limit in that area is 25 miles an hour and um, northbound 46.5% are going over the threshold and 16.9% in the southbound are going over the threshold. So in that area, we got uh, 6,600 cars or so, and it looks like we got some speeding issues in that area. Okay, so citywide, so the 19 spots we collected data, or we've collected a lot more data, we just presented it, and we didn't cherry pick this by any stretch. I said, that's enough. I know you guys are gonna get bored looking at all these numbers. We have a lot more data we could have presented on tonight. But just on those vehicle counts, so the thresholds, let's just look at that. So we have 133,803 cars we counted for those particular days. We just added them all up and said, how many cars did we count in those 19 locations, 38 different spots, so each direction, either northbound, southbound, westbound, eastbound. So 16,235 are going at least 11 to 15 miles over the posted speed limit. And then we can read down 16 to 20, 4,091 cars are going over the speed limit in those bins that, that bin there, 16 to 20. And 1,233 are going 21 to 25, 26 to 30, 526. And then we have 1,138 are going at least 31 miles over the posted speed limit. So if you look at the counts again, 133,803 vehicles we counted or Justine counted and Troy. And going over the threshold, 22,432 are going at least 11 miles over the, the, thresh, the speed limit. So that equates to 16.8% of the vehicles that we counted for those days are going over the posted speed limit. So it's one out of six. So you could just say one out of six. That's the way I looked at it. So that's what I have to present on the data. And anybody want to finish it up? OK, thanks. Abhishek's going to finish it up. Thank you, Gus. We also looked at some of the national studies and what it said, uh, what it concluded about uh, the automated speed cameras or automated speed enforcement systems and uh, how they are implemented uh, across the United States and even some of the studies which were international. So looking at that, uh, so the National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration uh, publishes a new edition of this guide every two and a half years, which is known as countermeasures that work uh, this guide is a basic reference to assist state highway safety offices select effective science-based traffic safety countermeasures for major uh, highway safety problems, mostly intended for uh, state agencies to, to help them select um, and make new solutions for making uh, traffic safe. And uh, from 2011 to 2020, uh, multiple editions of the study have identified automated uh, speed enforcement as, uh, as one of the most effective uh, countermeasures for uh, speed safety grading. So they grade uh, different measures, including uh, um, the automated speed enforcement out of a, uh, they, give out of, they give five stars to the most effective Grading, uh, the most effective measures, uh, and besides uh, besides 
uh, speed, uh, automated speed enforcement, only speed limits have the five star gradings. And then there are others with, there are, no, there are others with four, three, and uh, lower gradings. Coming back to the National Transportation Safety Board study on passenger vehicle, uh, uh, it described uh, AAC as a data-driven technology-based solution for speed enforcement in addition to other data-driven approaches for in-person speed enforcement. And I could find some parallels with our creating an equitable community of choice statement of creating a high-performing community that's data-driven. Um, as well as uh, currently there are 183 US communities that use ASC systems. Um, this, is pu this is published again by the IHS, uh, which I have provided a link uh, at the end of this presentation. The NTSB also uh, looked at some of the existing uh, studies and of, uh, of the effectiveness of the ASC cameras. So there were, these were the three which were the most latest ones are, uh, so in 2007, NHTSA published a review of 13 studies of ASC programs, which included one program in the United States, uh, and they found out that four out of the 13 studies uh, which examined fixed ASC programs and generally found that injury crashes at fixed ASC locations declined between 20 to 25% after AC implementation. Um, the other nine studies examined mobile AC programs and found that injury crashes in mobile AC zones declined between 21 and 51%. So they, all these studies, 13 studies in 2007 showed a uh, decrease uh, with injury crashes uh, for both uh, mobile AC zones and fixed AC programs. In, in 2010, there, uh, there was a review of 28 studies of ASC, uh, automated speed enforcement in the United States, Canada, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. Determined that all 28 studies have found fewer crashes in ASC areas after the implementation of these programs. Uh, these studies reported reducing reduction of 8% to 49% for all crashes and reduction of 11% to 44% for crashes causing serious injuries or fatalities. Now these were some of the older studies, but most recently in 2015, the IIHS, which is the Insurance uh, Institute for Insurance and Highway Safety, uh, published a study of ASC programs in Mont Montgomery County, Maryland, which began, the program began in 2007, and they concluded, they found that seven and a half years after the program began, AC was associated with a 10% reduction in speed, in mean speeds, and a 62% reduction in the likelihood of speeding more than 10 miles per hour over the posted speed limit at AC sites. The likelihood that a crash involved in incapacitating injury or fatality decreased by 39%, on ASC eligible roads and the corridor approach further reduced this likelihood by 30% compared to what would have happened. So basically they found uh, 10, uh, they found reduction in uh, speeding as well as fatality, uh, injury, uh, crashes which involved fatalities or uh, incapacitating injury. And finally, um, uh, also, they included the, the likelihood that a crash uh, was speeding related decreased by 8%. They also found that AAC ineligible roads, so these were the roads where AAC was not implemented uh, in the county. The likelihood that a crash involved an incapacitating injury or fatality decreased by 27% on ineligible roads and uh, that a crash was rela speeding related decreased by 22%. So not only the, the, the fatality, uh, the speeding reduced, but also uh, crashes with fatality related to speeding decreased. And this demonstrated a positive spillover effect in which the benefits of ASC uh, was expanded beyond those implemented sites. Um, 
And finally, uh, the Center for Disease Control, uh, this was very interesting, which I found out. The CDC, uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, notes that AAC can reduce crashes substantially and includes uh, AAC as the only speeding related countermeasures in their motor vehicle prioritizing interventions and cost calculator for states. Now this is an online tool for states to choose cost effective interventions to prevent motor vehicle related casualties. We, uh, so this is their, uh, they have 14 interventions for reducing uh, motor vehicle related casualties and this is one, uh, included, this is part of that invent, uh, those countermeasures also, and this is the only countermeasures which is related to speeding related fatal um, crashes and casual casualties. So these are some of the links I talked about, uh, IIHS, and um, I think we can open up for questions. Okay, thank you all very much. Well, let's uh, open up for questions and discussion, please. <clears throat> Mr. Resnick. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Uh, so, Gus, could you tell me uh, how many accidents there were on the, on the days that you were uh, getting these statistics? Uh, Gus Sahoya, city engineer. No, I can't, but we can get them for you. I mean, because we're, we're, we're relating speed to accidents. And so I would think that that would be good because from what the figures are, which we just got today, which we're not able to go over, so this is a guess, it looks like we would have collected $2 million just in the data that you gave us. So it's curious, and a 28% reduction that the National Transportation Safety Board is talking about, and transportation, if, it, if, there, were no, if there were no accidents during this time, uh, you know, those kind of statistics, I'm, I'm kind of surprised. But what's the enforcement level? Um, did you see, were there any, was there any enforcement? Was there a, a, a squad car even parked on the side of the road oh, for this? No. No, as Justine pointed out, these are uh, computer chips that we put in the pavement. They're taped down, so they're sure. incognito. Nobody knows that we're counting, sure. unless you know that there's a chip there. But you mentioned that on Pennsylvania, just the presence of a squad car. I'm still looking I'm saying, at that I'm saying at Floor Park whenever I drive by. You know, I'm still looking like you mentioned that there's a reputation for a police officer there. There is. Yes. So with and the that's, data that's that, why I brought that up. Yep. Yeah. With the data that you gathered, gathered, what traffic calming activities do you recommend? We haven't looked at it in traffic calming measures at all, particularly like the Northwest Arterial. Um, Traffic cameras, speed, um, speed shields, where they actually tell you the speed. Um, that might be um, something we could look at. But what, what we're presenting, engineers presenting tonight, is strictly the counts and the people that are going over that threshold. Okay, so thank you. We just wanted to present that so one out of six vehicles that we measured out of that 133,000 cars are going over the threshold. Absolutely. So the Institute of Transportation Engineers has 19 different uh, methods. Uh, a couple questions about what was presented. Um, speed related. What does that What does that mean? Uh, does that mean that speed is one of the many aspects, like along with driver distraction, the age of the driver, or is it a primary cause? What is speed related? You You mentioned, sir, 29 percent. What is it, are speed related? So this was discussed, uh, this was defined in the methodology of the study where FARS, this is based on the FARS fatality. Fatality analysis reporting system where these were accidents where the, the passenger vehicles were growing either over the speed limit or they were going a sp at a speed limit which was uh, not expected for that road, so these were accidents um, which were having involved a speeding vehicle. Now there can be other factors involved, um, like alcohol impairment we explored, or the type of roads, but speeding was a factor, the common factor in all of these uh, accidents. 
All right, thank you. Um, so I have a question for the chief, if you don't mind. I, I was looking through this presentation, and what, what I got was, is reckless driving safe? No. Is driving way too fast safe? No. Do ticket cameras make things safer? Maybe and sometimes. Uh, that's, what, that's what we give for the Iowa camera data that I've been looking at. Um, but Chief, now you, you mentioned that you actually were a traffic cop, as they say, and did you ever um, let somebody go with a warning? Sure. And what were some of the reasons? Well, it, you know, what you, when you talk about that, this is part of that bias, right, that they talk about with speed cameras versus not with the officer, and, and is there a bias that the officer has? Does every officer have a soft spot for something? We're all different. Um, to answer your question, yeah, I, I've let people go. I've had people with reasons that they've done that. Uh, but for the most part, you know, the reasons, you know, define what that is. Um, is there a reason to go 31 miles an hour over the speed limit? Probably not. That, that's unsafe, you know, as, as they pointed out there. Um, but is there a way that I need to give them a ticket to slow them down? I don't know. That, and that depended on the situation. Right. And, and so, you know, it's just talking to you and they were just realizing that, you know, wow, you're right. That I was I didn't realize it necessarily that I was going faster, but you noticed it and you noticed that speed as they say, speed kills, they used to say that. And, uh, and they appreciated you uh, stopping them, or at least they would say that, and whew, I got away with that. Um, and so I would just say that you notice that um, some roads feel safer. I mean, probably, I, and that's why I asked about the, the safety of that uh, JFK, uh, be, uh, between JFK and Central on, um, on the Northwest Arterial, uh, being 50 miles an hour, it's, it's a pretty safe road is what it looks like when you drive it. You know, uh, you should stay within the speed limit. I get it. It feels very safe. Uh, and so um, if you're not really paying attention, it's easy to go too fast. But I appreciate your, your, uh, the, the personal the touch that you had that you say that, yes, uh, would, would you, it's, it's hard. 25% of the time maybe you gave them a warning. Yeah, I can't even give you a number yeah, on that, but it, it wasn't actually very high, honestly, um, with that. But I, you know, there is times where I gave warnings. So what's the enforcement Mr. level? Mr. Resnick, if, if you don't mind, given time, can I let other people jump in and then you can jump back in? Would Thank that be you okay? Very much. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Roussel. Thank you. And I thought that information was really shocking. It was really not what I expected to hear. And, and it seems to me that speeding is a symptom. It's a symptom that people do not feel that speeding laws need to be obeyed or maybe they're even not paying close attention. And so I'd like to ask a real basic question is, how do we determine our speed limits? How do we know what's a safe speed for a particular road? Gus Ahoya, city engineer. So what traffic engineers typically do, and, and this computer will tell you what we call is the 85th percentile. So that means that 15% of the people are going over a certain speed limit. So in each one of those um, um, data sets that we um, com computed uh, data, the computer will tell us what 15% are going over the speed limit. So they'll tell you that speed limit, and it might be like, if it's 25, it might be, um, I'm guessing here like 36% are going over, 15% over the speed limit, which is the 85th percentile. And then we look at that speed and determine it's usually right around that speed or like five miles below that speed. Now in residential areas, it's set at 25 miles an hour. So we usually look at that criteria, the 85th percentile, and we look at the safety of the road and geometry and everything like that, and we determine speed limits. And sometimes we modify them. Justine says that we get complaints, and we do get complaints in different areas of town, and we take that uh, little computer chip and we'll put it out in the pavement and determine the speed limit, and sometimes we raise it, sometimes we don't. Okay, that's... But we look at that, and traffic engineers all across the country use that 85th percentile um, when they determine speed limits. Okay, well, 
thank you. And then I had one other question I had was um, those solar or, or the radar speed signs that just can be moved around. How, how effective do you see those um, being? I, I saw them up on North Grand View just for a couple days and then they were gone. And um, I just wondered how you use them and if the, you feel they're effective. Yeah, they are to a degree, but North Grandview, I'll give you an example, the data on that, three days in a row we had somebody over 90 miles an hour on that. And then when we parked up there on day four, guess what? It didn't happen. Um, yeah, yeah, so they are effective. You do see that, you see people breaking. I think they have, have um, some merit. They are, um, again, they, they have no enforcement ability. Mm -hmm. they, all they are is just flashing a speed. So they're a flashing speed sign, other than they, mm -hmm. they telling you what your speed is at on that. Um, but we do see some effectiveness, of them, but we also see some of the same stuff they're seeing with the, the traffic counts, and that these are some roads are higher than others. And um, one thing we didn't talk about is like time of day, day of week. Um, we talked a little bit about geographical locations. Some of these studies, you can look at the geographic. Why was eastbound and westbound different? You can look at the geographical s situations of that and say, okay, now I, I can see why one is slower than the other, just because of how it's at. So, yeah, we do see that. Thank you. So engineering used to just, we used to manage the, the speed shields and police took it over. But when we put it up historically, people would say, yeah, the week or two speeds were in check. But then as soon as we took them down, they started speeding again. That was what they, they found the neighbors in those particular areas. So that's some of the stuff, just like the enforcement. When there's no enforcement, people start getting you know, lax and then start speeding again. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, so thank you very much for the information. And I just have some data points and some questions for Jeremy, I do believe. Um, when you mentioned the driver distractions, do we have a database or information as to what really causes these crashes? Because I know this is about speed enforcement, but what about cell phone usage? Uh, and I noticed that the alcohol was mentioned uh, in the uh, National Transportation uh, Survey. Um, and also, in parallel to that, are there other communities in Iowa or communities our side that have speed enforcement cameras, and what are the results that they see? Yeah, so uh, multi-parts to that. Um, the first one being it, the data itself. So the, the data is all based upon the state action reporting system. Uh, ironically, I was just at the Governor's Traffic Safety Bureau mm -hmm. conference this past week, one of the things they are really, the DOT, Department of Transportation, the Iowa Department, is really accurate accident reporting. Mm -hmm. There's multiple things, and I think this was mentioned here, that can go into a crash. Uh, and generally there is. It's generally not just one thing. There's a list of causations, um, speed being one of them. That's, that's what we're focusing on because that's the enforcement side of that. As far as, you know, distracted driving. Very hard to enforce. We all know the cell phone stuff, right? And and that, and we've also seen the state try to do some things to make total hands free. Did not pass this year. Um, but what other distractions? How do you regulate somebody in an argument with their kids in the back seat? That's a distraction. Um, eating McDonald's as you're driving down the road. Loud music. There's all kinds of distractions that, quite frankly, are not enforceable. We 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 don't have the laws on it, and quite they'd be hard to. You know, um, you're having a bad day and your mind's at work. That's a distraction. Uh, those are things that, um, yeah, obviously distracted driving is very, and, and I think we've all kind of discussed that as part of this, not paying attention. I'm not paying attention. Suddenly I'm going 15 miles an hour over the speed limit. Yeah, that, and, and that can be a problem. Um, and again, there's a lot of things that go into stopping and that kind of stuff, particularly the faster you go. So we don't have a collective database as to the differentials. We Speed. do, we do, but it, it, I think it's what the state's saying too, is this is not the best, because we're not seeing a true, um, of all the different things that are going into that. Okay. And it requires, it's data in, you know, it's only good as the data in. And it's garbage in, garbage out, I know that yep. as well. Um, what about the um, municipalities of our size, uh, whether it's in Iowa or other locations, are there data points that we could look at to determine the effectiveness of the speed enforcement? Sure, and one of the ones that when I presented before was Cedar Rapids and their data, and they had, um, I was, uh, Davenport has, has speed cameras, Waterloo has, has cameras. Um, they, all of these in, in Des Moines, or, or if you're talking about agencies, um, okay. 
But you talk about that not all of them are speed. They also have the red light cameras, too, in, in a lot of these locations. So it's in conjunction with each other. And we haven't talked about that at all, obviously. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Just one quick question for you, Chief. So as of today, I think, yeah, we're 17 officers down on our police force. If we had 17 more officers, would we be utilizing those individuals for traffic enforcement? I guess how much more coverage for specific traffic enforcement do you think those individuals would provide us? For instance, stationing uh, an officer at Flora, on Grandview, um, on Pennsylvania, on the arterial, what would our abilities be if we were at full force? Yeah, and if you look at you know our staffing and how we place staff, and we gotta look at where most bang for our buck. Where can we be? Um, you're right, we're down. And, and as I proposed, the reason I proposed this initially was it's a force multiplier. There is that. You saw these locations daily. So you look at 24 speeders over 31 in a 48 hour. I can't sit an officer there, and I don't know the exact time, 24 seven to sit there to catch that speeder. It's just not, we have over 50,000 calls for service a year. The officers have to respond to other things. So looking at this as a way we can particularly some of these key locations, and that's, that's why I proposed that. Back to that, we, we had traffic enforcement unit and when we started losing bodies, we collapsed that in. But officers, we are doing more traffic enforcement to, as the patrol shifts allow, they're putting out traffic enforcement officers. We're addressing some of these hot spots. But I'll give you like the Northwest Arterial, when they out, went out and worked out, they said, as fast as I can turn around, I can and stop people. And that's with us there, with flashing lights. So um, there's that. Uh, the other part is, again, even with you look, 19 locations, just do the math on that. The 24-7, 365, I don't have enough officers. We couldn't hire enough officers to do that and sit in these spots to, to do the enforcement, that to catch these ones. Some spots, as you saw, it, you could sit there in a very short period of time. Other spots are, and the, you know, uh, and this doesn't count in all the one-offs, the complaints we get that, hey, hit my street, uh, hit that, and then, um, all the other extra attentions that we got. So it's some other speeding, or some other traffic things, you know, engine brakes, loud mufflers, uh, particularly loud motorcycles. We get those complaints a lot. And now we're gonna get into fireworks season. So we're gonna have a lot of extra attention, a lot of time spent, which then pulls us from other things which are labor intensive, which is, is traffic enforcement. And just one more question. The, uh, I had a constituent contact me and asked me if there were sound capabilities to detect some of these. and I. I'm aware that there's cameras on the market like that, but we haven't really reviewed those. No. Okay, thank you. All right, we're down to three minutes. Mr. Resnick has more questions. I think we have more questions. Mike, what's the expectation here from us this evening? Um, what are your thoughts on what we could see next? Well, when we brought this to the council originally, you had asked for additional information. Uh, our recommendation was implementation. Our recommendation hasn't changed any. So you just have to decide, do you have enough information where we could put it on an agenda and you could make, you could vote whether it's gonna happen or not, or no, we need more information before we have that. And if you need more information, we'll try and get it for you. So let, let's focus on that question. Is there more information that we as a council need to be able to make a better decision here or do we expect to see this on the next agenda? I'd entertain you, Ms. Wethel. The one thought that I had in reviewing this again and going back and looking at my previous notes was conversation about where the revenue would go. Um, I, I continue to have a concern that we need to have that discussion before implementation. I know that it's not common based on the ordinances I've reviewed from other cities. They don't include that within the ordinance, but I'm very, um, I'm wanting to utilize specific amounts of that revenue, specifically for first responders, police, fire, 911 dispatch, to create a retention and recruitment program and use that as a base of start. And potentially after 18 months, we could review what 30% of the revenue put toward that goal would be. Sure. Or, and so I think revenue discussion would be something I'd like to have. Okay, Ms. Farber? Yeah, I'd like to see more information about the results from Cedar Rapids, Davenport, Waterloo, and Des Moines okay. that you had mentioned. Okay, any others? We're really good. crushed for time right, right. now. Um, 
Mike, I'm getting a sense that we, we could use, we, we'd like to further this discussion, but we'd like to be able to, to have some more information to discuss about this. Is there a way we could make that uh, an action item, a receive and file type thing to be able to have on an agenda, or do we need to do that in another work session? Sure, I mean, just the limited amount of information that's been asked for, but, uh, which is basically what the other cities, their, their experience, I think we could collect that and get it to you. We probably have most of it already. Mr. So, Resnick Melch also mentioned, uh, you know, crash data um, for the days that were that we looked at, or something similar, or in that similar window, um, something to that effect. Um, and I think. Sure. Am I right, Mr. Resnick, that that's something you would like to see if we do that? Sure, we can get that. Okay. If, if we could ask for that on the next agenda, is that something we can we can look for? Or uh, we'll, be, we'll shoot for the next agenda. I won't understood. promise that. We'll get understood. We'll get you that those two pieces of information. Okay. And bring it to you as soon as we have it. So if it's the next agenda, we'll bring it to you then. Sounds good. So we're going to continue this discussion just to make it really clear to everybody. No decision was made tonight. We don't intend to make a decision at our next um, next council meeting, for example, on whether or not to move forward with this. We're still gathering information and, and having a discussion about this. Okay. Well, we are at time, so thank you very much, Chief. Um, thank you, Obishek, uh, Gus, and, and Justine, and everybody who was involved in this. We really appreciate this. Um, there being no further business in the work session, we will stand adjourned.